Um, yes, my name is Jacob Edesko. I work at Curity. Um, I will talk some about how we can work with devices that are not as smart as we're used to. I call it OAuth for your living room, and it's, it's really about getting the identity into a new box that we haven't thought about before, and we see this more and more. Um, about me, yeah, I work at Curity, I do OAuth, I do OpenID Connect, a lot of identity-related things every day. Um, short introduction. So, this is the problem we want to talk about today. I want my TV to play music um, of some unnamed streaming service, say. Uh, we need to do a couple things. We need to download an app if, the app, if the TV supports app. Mine does. It's horrible, but it does. Um, we need to get this app to connect to my streaming service somehow, and I need it to start streaming music. And obviously, since I work with Identity and OAuth, I want to use OAuth to do this. So there's a perfect flow, uh, the resource owner password flow, or password credentials flow, actually. But it's very long. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. If you were at the workshop also, you, you know what I'm going to say. Uh, we'll talk about this some. But it works like this. We got two things. We got a, a, a service, and we got the TV. And we got an API, which is the actual thing we're going to talk to, to get data. And we got an OAuth server. So we introduce an OAuth server at the streaming service. So what the resource owner, or the ROPC flow, will do is it will just send the request, the post request, with the form URL encoded body saying, there's the username of the user. Here's the password of the user. Here's the grant type. That means I'm. I want to use the resource on the flow right now. So it's just a switch telling the OWASP server what kind of flow we're doing. I want the client ID to be sent in there. I am the TV app, so you know that. And I authenticate myself as the TV app by the smart password coming in. And I want access to the permission music read. So essentially, the TV just collected my username and password. And I clicked logged in, and it just sent it. And the OWASP server says, yay, that looks great. It took the username password, probably checked it with the, an LDAP repository. It created a token and stuck the username in there and sent it back to the TV app. And the TV app can simply just send that token to the API. And the API should validate that it's a valid token. If we're using a JSON web token, it just decodes it or checks the signature and everything in it. You know all about that, probably. If it's an opaque token, it needs to call the OWASP server and check what's this. But end result, music is streaming. Super simple. We used OAuth. We got the TV to talk to my uh, streaming service. Few problems with this. Um, most streaming services, most music companies, most big companies don't really want your TV app to know to get their users and especially their users' passwords. Uh, who says we can trust this app? Who, who built this app? Maybe it was the music service who built it, but probably it was somebody else that thought that, well, this green or round music service has a great API. We can use that and build a client. Um, so the resource owner flow is really is not meant for this. So this first idea of, of picking it, it, it's absolutely wrong. It's actually there to just solve legacy problem. If we're building a new system, we should never use it. Why? It has built-in anti-patterns. You're taking the password, giving it to the third party, and the whole purpose of OAuth was don't take the password and give it to the third party. So somebody could have intercepted the password and logged it, and if they leak, well, this music service is in trouble. So yeah, this doesn't work. So you're thinking, why don't we just use regular OAuth? And with regular OAuth, what we really mean is the OAuth code flow. It's the most common OAuth flow. Has anyone used that? Yeah, oh, good. So for you who haven't, it works like this. Same setup. We have a TV. We have an OAuth server. And we have an API. Let's make a few assumptions for the code flow to work. The TV is a smart TV like my Samsung. It can actually have a, a browser in there. And you need that for the code flow, actually, unless you're, you're really hard coding stuff. 
Um, so what happens is you pop up a browser and you say, take me to this address. So you just give it a, a do a get in the browser. Just fill the, the URL bar with client ID equals TV app, scope equals music read, same as before. But now we say something else. We say response type equals code. So we mean, mean swap the flow now into the code flow. So we just go to the authorization server, to the OAuth server with these parameters. The OAuth server says, hmm, sounds good. Um, authenticate the user. Now there's a subtle difference of what we saw before. So we didn't start by picking the username and password from the user. We started by going to the authorization server. It shows a page. And this page actually comes, as you see, it has a little green icon there. So it belongs to the authorization server. So the user enters its credentials, but this time it enters it to the authorization server. Big difference. Uh, or to some other service that it calls, of course, but on the music service side. End result, the authorization service says, looks good so far. I'll give you a one-time code, a nonce, not more than once, that you can use to continue the code flow. So the TV closes the browser, takes this code, and makes another call. Now, without the browser, just a back-channel call. So this is very similar to the resource flow we did in the beginning, except we don't send username and password. We send a proof, a grant, that the user has logged in. Here's the proof for that. And I'm, by the way, a TV app, and I authenticate with this secret. And the grant type here, we're saying, I'm sending an authorization code. That means swap over to the code flow. That's what we're talking now. Last time, it said password. We did the resource flow. So that's how you control the flows in OAuth. Um, the OAuth server thinks this is much better. Uh, so it will give us two tokens this time. It will give us an access token and a refresh token. And like before, we're really happy about this. We take the access token, we send it to the API. The API can once again validate the token, see what's in it, and start streaming music. So when you're building your APIs, so far we've, we've used two flows. Uh, when you're building your APIs and you're supporting OAuth, the API should be completely agnostic to what flow was used in the beginning. From the API's perspective here, it should not care. It doesn't know that we were kind of doing an anti-pattern to get the token the first time and somewhat better pattern to get the token the second time. The, the API can't tell. The token should look the same. So you can build you know, 5,000 microservices just with a single library and put it in the front of your APIs and issue tokens any way you want. And that gives you a huge flexibility on how to authenticate users, how to get the data, um, <clears throat> get that data to the API. Except we're dealing with the TV. Uh, that's the biggest problem here. OK, we could enter the username password. We could enter it to the OWASP server even, if the TV allowed it. I'm thinking about my Samsung TV. I don't even think I could write an app that would actually open the browser. And if it did, it would be a horrible user experience, because um, that browser is probably the slowest one I've ever seen. And I have to work with something like that to enter my username and password. Um, or worse, it's not a TV. We're actually talking to uh, a speaker. Maybe we're talking to Alexa or some other bot and have an intelligent little speaker in our house. Actually, the same problem. I still want to stream music. I want to do it over my speaker. And the music service uh, doesn't want to allow that, of course, if I don't do it right. So let's look at the problems. We have this app. <laughs> Simple problem, stream music. But music service has my account, does not want to share it with others. And we got the remote or the speaker. Luckily, there's a new OAuth draft coming out. And it's actually pretty stable now. It's in draft 6, uh, but it hasn't changed much the last few uh, versions. It's called the OAuth device flow. So instead of the code flow or the resource owner flow, you can start looking at the device flow. Um, it's focusing on devices or on clients, as we say in OAuth lingo, that are UI incapable. Uh, perhaps they don't even have a UI, uh, a graphical user interface. And they're definitely not a web device in most cases. Um, 
So let's look at the device flow and see what we can do with that and compare it. We've got the API, we've got the OAuth server, and we've got the TV. First, we're sending a request. In the device flow, it actually sends something called a device authorization request. So it actually goes to a new endpoint. Um, sends in two parameters, client ID and scope. It may send in a password also, the client secret, but it's up to implementation. Um, so the TV says, I, I need to do some stuff. I need to read music. Give me some tokens. This time, the OWASP server responds, OK, let's see what we can do. So it gives you back a message that looks like this. A device code, a user code, a verification URI expires in an interval. Where the device code is something that the device should do now, should use in order to check in with the OWASP server. So the OWASP server is starting to put together some information here to create this authorization that we're needing. And the device should hold on to this device code in order to check when it's done. The user code, on the other hand, is something we need to hand over to the user so that the user can continue on its side and do something. And how the user should do this is by simply visiting a verification URI. <laughs> Oops. Um, and then we're saying, well, if you don't do this within 20 minutes, um, it's lost, or half 30 minutes, sorry. Um, and you should check in with us every five seconds. So it essentially says, go polling. Um, so we need to tell the user this. Um, depending on the device, we can do this in different ways. On a TV, you could display, go to this short URL that we came up with and enter this code. You actually probably have seen this. There's a lot of services that do something similar already, except it's not OAuth yet, but it probably will be pretty soon. So our APIs can relax, and, and we can use the tokens everywhere like we want to. Um, so it shows something like this. Still a bit like tricky, but what you're supposed to do now is you're supposed to take out your laptop, take out your phone, enter that URL on your phone. You'll meet something and, and do what it says there. Or you could show like a QR code or something else and say, you know, blip this and follow the flow. Then the device, the TV, continues. So it's showing this. And on the back side, it will call the OWA server on the interval that was given uh, with the client ID. And here we use a new grant type. Uh, before we had code, authorization code or password. Now we're having a new super long one because we're extending the spec. Uh, but that's just a string. Um, and we're sending in the device code. So we're saying, this is the session I'm looking for. This is the authorization somebody should finish for me. The server, on the other hand, it will respond with an error message. It will say, authorization pending. So we're waiting. Just keep polling. I know what Audrey said about polling yesterday, but there's not much to do on this case, I think. Um, on the front channel, you pick up your iPhone or your Android phone or Windows phone or Nokia phone, and you scan the QR code. Um, that takes you to a URL that will show you two things. First, it will show you a page that says the TV app wants to get access to your music account, and it wants to stream music. Pretty similar to what happens if you, if you connect something with Facebook, for instance. This app wants to post stuff on your wall and, and read all your mail. Um, then you click yes. That sounds good. Step two, you need to be authenticated. So you're, you have to either enter your username password or use whatever means of authentication that you do for this service. Maybe that's your Facebook account or uh, in Sweden, something else. Um, that can take as long as you want. It's not connected to the TV at any point uh, here. So it does that communicating to the OWASP server. And when you're done, the OWASP server will update the session on the back end saying, yes, OK, the authorization has been given. So the next time the device polls, it will still send in the same device code unless 30 minutes has gone by. The OWASP server will now say, yes, this has been granted. You will now get a token. You will actually get two tokens, an access token and a refresh token. And the app can take this. It can go to the API, ask for the data, 
and great success. We will get streaming without having to use this horrible remote on the TV. So a couple things. How is this different? Well, you, you see it clearly. We do out-of-band authorization. So the phone or the laptop, whatever you use, it's actually not connected to the, to the system we're authenticating to or to, to the system we're authorizing. So new thing. This hasn't been done in OAuth before. Um, nice about it, it may not be a TV, like we said. It could be a speaker. It could be something completely different. It could be your, your thermostat or whatever. Um, so how would you do that? How would you communicate? Well, the spec is pretty open. All it says is you need a way to communicate a URL that the user needs to go to. Um, so it doesn't have to be a QR code. It could be NFC. You just have to be you know, touching it or be close to it. It could be a high-frequency audio. It could be you know, real uh, audible audio or yeah, whatever you can think of, uh, Bluetooth. So just you know, hold something near to it to, to take the out-of-band further on. The only thing that the spec is pretty clear about is it needs to be near, near field communication. Like you can't be preferably not in another room, preferably not in another apartment or in another country. Uh, you shouldn't send this information over the internet. It need, you need to be in the room to get this. Uh, it's an attack vector otherwise. Um, so the, the remaining question is, how often do you have to do that? If it's still a bit cumbersome. I mean, I still need to take out my phone, and I still need to authenticate. Um, that was what the refresh was for. I only said you got a refresh token. I guess most of you know what a refresh token is, but if you don't, I'll show it here. So you're, you're reading all this data. You're streaming the music, and all of a sudden, you get a 401 back saying, this token has expired. Access tokens, they don't live very long. They usually live for like 15 minutes or five or, or something, less than half hour in most cases. Um, what do you do then? Well, you take the refresh token that you got, and you make another call to the authorization server. You say, hi, I'm still the TV app, um, still my secret, using another grant type. Swap mode of the authorization server, and now refresh. So what I send in is the refresh token that I got. So it's essentially just a, a ticket to get other tickets. And the authorization service says, yeah, that looks great. Uh, that refresh token is still valid. I'll give you a new access token and a new refresh token. So you can keep those. The first refresh token is spent, so that cannot be used again. Um, oh. And yeah, you can go streaming. <laughs> that was the OAuth device flow. And that was all I had to say. So. Thank you.